Okay. Um, Nick, if you're ready, you can go ahead and start. This is uh, Nicholas Saunders from the University of Hawaii talking about um, planetary orbits. I believe. All right. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here remotely. Wish I could be there in person. Um, but my name is Nick Saunders. I'm a, a fifth year grad student at the University of Hawaii. And I'll be on the, the postdoc job market this fall. Um, and I'm really interested in stellar evolution and particularly how stellar evolution uh, affects the, the planets around those stars. And today I'll specifically be talking about uh, the orbital evolution of giant planets after their host stars leave the main sequence. So just to set the stage a little bit, I'll give a, a very quick refresher, kind of crash course on stellar and planetary evolution. Uh, and so you start with a big cloud of gas and dust collapses down into a disk. In the center of that disk, you have your young star forming. And then gradually in that disk, planet formation starts to occur. Uh, the material that's left over after planet formation gets kind of blown out of the system. And you end up with a main sequence star with uh, a handful of planets orbiting it. And for a, a star with about the mass of the sun, this phase will last 10 billion years or so. And then after this, the star will leave the main sequence, become a subgiant, and then a red giant as it cools off and expands, um, becomes much more luminous. Uh, convection is occurring deeper in the, the atmosphere of the star. Uh, and it has some planets still orbiting it. And then eventually it blows off its outer, its outer layers and you're left with just a white dwarf. And so this seems like kind of a, a the way that I presented this is a very simple kind of well-solved picture for how this happens. But the truth is there are still some real mysteries in this process, um, particularly at early times when you have planet formation occurring in the disk, there's still some real mysteries around how plan planet formation occurs, how planets end up in their, their configurations where we observe them, especially because some of the systems we've discovered, for example, hot Jupiters are very different from anything we see in our own solar system. There are also a lot of mysteries on the other end of the main sequence. Uh, and it's still really unclear kind of what happens to planets when their host stars leave the main sequence. At what point are they engulfed by their stars? Uh, what happens to their orbits um, and, and kind of the, the eventual fates of planets are still a bit uncertain. And so just to highlight this, uh, one of these mysteries, the theories for hot Jupiter formation are still really debated in the literature. And there are a couple leading theories for how you end up with such massive planets on such close in orbits. And the, the two that I'll talk about are the disk migration scenario, where you have a giant planet that forms at a, a more distant orbit from its star, similar to where Jupiter is in our solar system. And then gradually it moves in through the disk uh, as it loses angular momentum through interactions with that disk before it's uh, kind of removed from the system. And you end up with a hot Jupiter on a circular close in orbit. The other leading theory is called high eccentricity migration. And that's shown in the bottom diagram. And this is where similarly, you have a giant planet that forms far out from its star. And then after the material that's left over from planet formation is expelled from the system, uh, it's, it's uh, launched into this highly eccentric inclined orbit due to scattering events with other giant planets in the system. So some gravitational interaction with another giant planet causes it to uh, enter this highly inclined, highly eccentric orbit. And then gradually it loses that angular momentum and circularizes as it in spirals close in and finally aligns. And so you can see that these both start and end in the same place, but the processes in the middle are still really uncertain. And so the, the main processes that, I, that I'll talk about throughout this talk uh, that are really important in shaping the, the dynamical history of exoplanets and hot Jupiters in particular are in spiral as a, a planet loses angular momentum and moves into a closer orbit, circularization as that eccentricity is damped out, and finally realignment as that uh, spin orbit misalignment is, is damped out. And I'll talk more specifically about these later on. But understanding these processes is really important. And also understanding the time scales for these processes is really important because you can start to distinguish between these hot Jupiter formation pathways by getting a better picture of how these mechanisms act and how long it takes for them to act on these giant planets. And one way to get a really nice 
picture of, of both the processes and the time scales of these processes is by looking at planets orbiting evolved stars, such as subgiants, which are rapidly undergoing structural changes that uh, change the way that, um, that tides act on the planet and things like that. And so it's a really nice window of evolution to kind of get a, a much clearer understanding of how these mechanisms work. Uh, unfortunately, there's a very small sample uh, relatively of, of planets orbiting evolved stars. So this is kind of what the picture looked like before TESS. This is from a, a 2019 paper by Dan Huber. And you can see that on this HR diagram, which shows the, the stellar radius on the y-axis and the effective temperature on the x-axis, the population of planet hosts is really dominated by main sequence stars. So all of these are, uh, are stars that host confirmed exoplanets. You can see that there's this real density on the main sequence of a wide variety of spectral types. And then as you move on to the subgiant branch, there are very few stars with confirmed exoplanets, and then even fewer as you move up to the red giant branch. And this is partly because it's very difficult to detect planets around evolved stars. So to highlight this, here's what a, a Jupiter-sized planet transiting a main sequence star looks like. It's a nice, deep, very high signal-to-noise transit. But if we take a star of the same mass with a planet of the same radius at a similar orbital period and look at what a single transit from that looks like, it looks like this, right? And so the signal to noise is way lower, the transit is much shallower, and the uh, duration of the transit is longer. And so it becomes very difficult to detect these just because of how luminous and noisy these evolved stars are. Uh, luckily, with TESS, we have a much larger sample to search for these things, right? So TESS is called is the exoplanet, the transiting exoplanet survey satellite. It's a space telescope that just stares at basically the entire sky uh, and provides this high precision space-based time series photometry. So on the left, I show the this coverage map for TESS, and you can see that most of the sky is observed for about 27 days at a time with some regions like the continuous viewing zone here shown in red, uh, being observed for almost a year at a time. Uh, and so the, the full sky is observed in these, uh, what's called a full frame image, which were originally taken every 30 minutes and then it was updated to every 10 minutes. Um, but it allows you to search for planets around all of the brightest stars uh, in the sky. Uh, and so this is just an example of what the, the test detector looks like. You can see that it spans a, a really wide region of the sky uh, with a, a huge density of stars. So to search for transient exoplanets around these stars, uh, we developed the uh, GIANTS pipeline. And so this is uh, a photometry pipeline that's built with light curve, where you uh, download the raw pixel data from tests and create a noise model that removes the kind of scattered light background shown by these really significant spikes. And you're left with a nice uh, detrended light curve that you can use to search for, for those transits. And so this is uh, a pipeline that I wrote for my 2022 paper, which was the first in what we call the Giants Transiting Giants Survey. And the reason that we wrote our own pipeline for this is that, as I showed earlier, the transits of planets around evolved stars are really shallow, really low signal to noise, and also long duration. And it's really easy to accidentally remove these in the detrending process, particularly because of their longer duration. And so we, we wrote a pipeline that is specifically optimized to preserve these longer duration, low signal to noise transits. And here's just an example of, of kind of one of the transits for a target in our, in our sample that was removed by another pipeline. Um, and just to, to show this in how you actually search for these planets, uh, you search for them with typically a, a box least squares periodogram, which just looks for periodic box shaped dips in your, in your light curve. And so uh, what I show here is, is two different light curves on top with R's on the bottom. And you can see that in the periodogram space there are these really uh, tightly resolved period spikes that are uh, detected in the, the giant light curve that are lower signal to noise and kind of harder to detect than the other ones. Uh, and if you squinted it for a minute, you might be able to actually pick out the phase folded transit. But if not, I'll go ahead and circle it. It's right there. So it's pretty shallow, pretty hard to detect. Um, our light curves also were useful in preserving uh, oscillations in red giant stars. 
And so I'll just really quickly highlight that this paper that uh, Dennis Stello wrote found oscillations in about 4,000 Kepler field red giants. Um, and you can see here on the, the left is the, the test power spectrum. I won't get into too much detail on this, but if you're interested in, in uh, astroseismology, this will be interesting to you. So the left is the test power spectrum, the right is the Kepler power spectrum. And so even with much less data, we were able to identify these power excesses that can be used to do really precise stellar characterization um, in, in our light curves. So far, the Giants Transiting and Giants Survey has led to seven published uh, confirmed exoplanets. And you can see that now looking at this updated HR diagram, we're starting to really fill in some of the space that was very empty before, right? So there's a lot more interesting stuff that you can learn about the kind of evolution of planetary systems now that we have a larger sample of, of things to compare to. And some of the main questions that we're focusing on are uh, listed here. So first is how and when do hot Jupiters become inflated? How do the orbits of, of planets evolve? And how does the occurrence rate of giant planets change as a function of stellar evolution? And today I'll be focusing on this middle question, how do the, the orbits of planets evolve? And one of the reasons that uh, we benefit from a larger sample of evolved stars is that tides play a very important role in shaping the orbits of these planets. So this is a figure from the Dawson and Johnson uh, review paper on exoplanets um, that shows some of the kind of dominant tidal processes that shape exoplanet systems. So here I show the eccentricity of a planet's orbit on the y-axis versus its semi-major axis on the x-axis. And you can see that there are quite a few uh, ways that, that planets can uh, interact with either other planets in the system or with their stars and that shape their orbits. And so some of the ones that will end up being important here are planet-planet scattering, which I talked about for the high eccentricity and migration, where you have uh, two planets interacting that sends one into a highly eccentric orbit. So it'll get tossed up somewhere here. You have this high eccentricity migration where the planet gradually loses that eccentricity through uh, tidal interactions with its, with its host star. And it will spiral in towards its star, towards a shorter semi-major axis and gradually circularize. And so the picture you can kind of think of is that planets will start further out here, be scattered into these highly eccentric orbits and then move down uh, kind of through this, this red region here. And stellar evolution will accelerate these tidal processes, particularly for stars uh, a little more massive than the sun. And the reason for this is that uh, the, the regions in the star where convection is occurring uh, change as the star evolves. And so I'll show this very cartoon picture of where convection occurs because it's really important for, for understanding the tidal processes here. And so this is just uh, a very, very simple picture of stellar evolution where the little circular arrows indicate where convection is occurring. So for a solar mass star, you have a radiative core on the main sequence and a convective envelope. And then as that solar mass star evolves off of the main sequence, it still maintains the same structure, but the uh, convective envelope deepens um, as, the, as the star cools. But stars that are more massive than the sun actually have radiative envelopes on the main sequence and convective cores. Uh, and then as they evolve, they will uh, quench convection in their cores and eventually gain these deeper surface convective envelopes. And so their structure ends up kind of resembling the similar structure of, of a lower mass star. And so this distinction is, is split by what's called the craft break, which happens at about 6,200 Kelvin, where things that are hotter than about 6,250 Kelvin um, have typically radiative envelopes on the main sequence and cooler have those convective envelopes. And so the things that we're really interested in understanding better are things that start uh, more massive than the craft break and then end up crossing the craft break as they cool and uh, evolve into subgiants. So these things that gain convective envelopes after their main sequence lifetime are really excellent uh, examples for, for kind of probing these, these tidal processes. So I'll take a very brief detour really quickly because uh, the craft break is actually defined in rotation space. This is where it appears very clearly. So here's another HR diagram where now I'm just coloring the, the regions by uh, the 
rotation period of the star, right? So you have really rapid rotation occurring for these hotter stars, things that sit above the craft break. And then the things that sit cooler than the craft break are slower rotation. So typically tens of days, and then eventually up to, to hundreds of days as they evolve. Whereas the things hotter than the craft break are less than days, to the, or days to, to less than days. They can spin very rapidly. Um, and this is really nice. Uh, this, this relationship makes it very clear where this, this distinction happens. And the reason that there's such a sharp break here is that lower mass stars that have these convective envelopes undergo uh, magnetic breaking. So their convection drives uh, a dynamo, which then can interact with the, the wind that's blown from the star to break the rotation of the star and slow it down over time. And this can be leveraged to actually get stellar ages. So this is something called gyrochronology. Because stars gradually slow down as they age due to these interactions with their, their dynamos, you can actually characterize these relationships between the rotation period of a star and its age. And this has been really well characterized for kind of younger stars up to about the age of the sun for sun-like stars um, using clusters. And so this is a, a figure from a paper by Luke Bauma from last year that shows the rotation period on the y-axis versus the effective temperature on the x-axis. And the different colored points are different clusters. And you can see that each cluster uh, kind of lies along a different sequence. And as the clusters get older, these sequences get tighter as things kind of converge into to more consistent sequences. But you can see that gradually over time, these lines move up as the clusters get older. So this is really nice because now if you see a field star that's isolated, you measure its rotation period, you have a way to uh, infer what its age might be. Unfortunately, this doesn't hold uh, beyond about the age of the sun. It was found that <clears throat> it was found that things older than the sun or more evolved than the sun uh, maintain their rapid rotation um, for most of their main sequence lifetimes. And so this is uh, this led to the idea that stars undergo this phase of weakened magnetic breaking, where they're no longer spinning down at the same rate that they were for the first half of their main sequence lifetimes, and it may be due to a, a change in the dynamo or some some kind of magnetic transition that these stars undergo. Um, and I'll point you to some papers by Jen Van Saders or Travis Nighthat if you're interested in learning more. Um, but uh, I highlight this because earlier this year I published a paper that looked at a sample of stars with really precisely measured rotation periods and ages uh, from Kepler using astro seismology. And we were able to place kind of better constraints on when this magnetic transition might occur or just when stars deviate from kind of the standard spin down scenario. And so what I'm showing here is the rotation period on the y axis now versus age on the x-axis, and I've split it up into three different temperature bins, because this is very mass dependent. And you can see that stars follow this kind of uh, standard spin down sequence that's been really well characterized up until about the age of the sun, which is shown here, uh, at, at which point they're more consistent with kind of this weakened breaking scenario where they're now conserving their angular momentum. Okay, just a, a quick aside, but now back to, uh, back to planets. And so one of the things that I, I wanted to mention is that uh, we produced a bunch of stellar models to, to do this analysis. Um, it was done by kind of training a, a neural network on a, a big grid of stellar models. Um, and those stellar models ended up being really valuable for understanding the dynamical evolution of planetary systems as well, because we were tracing things like the rotation period of the star, as well as the interior structure evolution. Um, and so, for example, this is what the interior structure of one of the stars in our in our model grid looks like. Here on the y-axis, I'm showing the mass fraction. So this is kind of just a, a proxy for position inside the star. And the shaded regions show where convection is occurring. So like I talked about for the kind of higher mass stars earlier, on the main sequence, you have this convective core and almost no convective envelope. And then when that star leaves the main sequence, that convective core disappears and you get this surface convective envelope that starts to grow. And so this uh, emergence of a surface convection zone ends up being really important for the dynamical evolution of, of the planets orbiting these stars. And so specifically, I'll be talking today about uh, the eccentricity and the obliquity of, of some exoplanets that are discovered. So starting with the eccentricity, uh, this is work that was led mostly by Dr. Sam Grunblatt, who's a research 
uh, scientist at Johns Hopkins. And so this was one of the papers in our Giants Transiting and Giants surveys. And it, it shows a uh, highly eccentric hot Jupiter orbiting a subgiant star. And so I show here just the phase folded test photometry on the left with our transit model and the radial velocity signal on the right. And you can see that instead of a, a nice smooth sinusoidal curve that you would see for a circular orbit, we have this peak that, that uh, indicates that the orbit is highly eccentric. So the two things that I want to highlight here are that this is kind of a longer period hot Jupiter or maybe a warm Jupiter even, the longer period giant planet than what we typically find around evolved stars. And it's also more eccentric than most of the things uh, we see around evolved stars. And so this led to uh, a study of how the eccentricities of giant planets around evolved stars compared to those around main sequence stars. And what I show here is a comparison of this eccentricity period relationship for planets around evolved stars shown in red and main sequence stars shown in gray. And you can see that the distribution of main sequence stars is pretty broad. There's kind of a, a range of eccentricities that we observe. Whereas for these evolved stars, they tend to follow this tighter relationship uh, shown here by the, the kind of red outlines. And so there are a couple ways you might end up with this distribution. Uh, one of them is this scattering, this planet-planet scattering process that I talked about earlier. So over time, uh, the kind of cumulative probability that a planet undergoes a scattering event becomes more likely over its full main sequence lifetime. And so you can end up scattering these things that are on circular, uh, longer period orbits up to these more eccentric, longer period orbits and end up with things up here. And then gradually uh, you end up with this migration and circularization that I talked about as the planets that are at these high eccentricity, long period orbits move down to the left on this diagram. Uh, and both of these will kind of drive a, a tighter relationship in the eccentricity distribution for planets around evolved stars. And so this evolved planet population has provided some evidence that planets undergo uh, a few of these processes I've talked about, the planet-planet scattering, high eccentricity migration, and gradual in-spiral. And one of the questions this raises is what implications does this have for the stability of, of all planetary systems or particularly Earth-like planets? What does this tell us about kind of the, the dynamical history of, of systems with, with Earth-like planets in the habitable zone? And one of the things that we really hope to do is push this relationship to longer periods to better understand how the, the trend in eccentricity and period extends. Um, because as you can see, it, it the longest period one we have is at about 50 days right now. And so it'll be really valuable to kind of extend this relationship and better compare it to the main sequence population. So the other main uh, effect that I wanna talk about today is obliquity. So the obliquity is, uh, which I defined by lambda here, is the angle between the orbital plane of a planet and the spin axis of its star. So you can see that the, spin of this star is highlighted kind of by the little arrow here. One side is blue shifted towards us, one side is red shifted away from us because of the rotation. Uh, and a planet on the uh, on a aligned orbit will just transit directly across the limb of the star like this, whereas something that's misaligned will have some, some angle between that spin axis and the, the orbital plane. And there appears to be a, an interesting difference in the distributions of obliquities on either side of the craft break. So on the cool end of the craft break, you have this uh, population that shows typically low obliquities. You can see with the color bar here that these are all pretty near zero degrees in, uh, in obliquity. And then above the craft break on the hot side, uh, you have this wider range in the observed obliquity distribution. Uh, it's not necessarily aligned, but they're not uh, all piled up at some specific value. So there's this kind of uh, broad distribution of, of, of spin orbit angles seen above the craft rake. And the reason this is really interesting for planet formation specifically is that the different uh, hot Jupiter formation pathways that I described predict different distributions of obliquity. So uh, the disk migration pathway predicts circular and well-aligned orbits around all stars. Well, the high eccentricity migration pathway predicts circular and aligned orbits around cool stars, 
uh, and circular and misaligned orbits around hot stars. Um, but I'll put a really big asterisk on this, which is that that's only if realignment is efficient, right? So you only would see uh, circular and aligned orbits if there's some mechanism for that obliquity to be damped out around the cool stars. And so by looking at hot Jupiters around evolved stars, which have gained these deep convective envelopes, we can start to poke at whether it is the presence of a convective envelope that's important for determining the, uh, the uh, eventual obliquity and the dynamical history. So if we now look at the distribution of obliquities on the y-axis as a function of effective temperature on the x-axis, it really shows this, this uh, kind of distinct distribution on either side of the craft break even more clearly. And on the far right of this plot, I show just the kind of kernel density of the obliquities uh, split up into the hot stars shown in red and the cool stars shown in blue. And you can see this big pile up in the cool stars around zero, around zero showing that it's a, a nicely aligned population. And again, this, this really broad distribution for the, the hot stars. So the question really becomes, what happens if you start hotter than the craft break on the main sequence? And then as the star evolves into a subgiant, you end up cooler than the craft break. Um, and understanding the, the dynamical history across this, this line here will be really valuable for uh, kind of pinning down both the time scales and the efficiencies of, of these damping effects. Sorry, I can't quite hear that. Oh, yeah. Um, Amy just asked if you could re-explain what the craft break is. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let me just quickly go back to this image. Yeah, and, and feel free to interrupt at any point if you have, if you have questions. Um, so the craft break is uh, nominally, uh, you can define it by a temperature or a mass. It's around on the main sequence. 60 to 50 Kelvin or around 1.2 solar masses. But the really important feature on either side of the craft break is that cooler than the craft break, you have a convective envelope and hotter than the craft break, you have a radiative envelope. And the reason that's important here is that these dynamical tides that drive processes like circularization and, and in spiral and obliquity damping require a convective envelope because that's the kind of mechanism that that angular momentum is, is dissipated is, is through the raising of tides in a convective envelope. Okay, thank you. I think I missed whatever the craft break is connected to was. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, it's it's very important. So I'm glad we clarified now. I'm going to be saying the word craft break a lot. <laughs> like I know we this, but it's not in our <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, the the thing that we're really interested in is is probing these stars that have crossed the craft break, right? And so we can get at this with an observation of the roster mclaughlin effect. And so this is uh, achieved by taking radial velocities during a planet's transit. And so because the planet is blocking regions of the star that are red shifted and blue shifted relative to us, uh, you get this additional component on top of your kind of typical radial velocity curve uh, because of the, the difference in uh, redshift and blue shift as you block these different regions of the star. And so if it's a well-aligned system like this shown on the left, you get a nice smooth sine curve added onto your radial velocity trend. But the amplitude and morphology of this will change as you move away from that well-aligned orbit. Um, and so this allows you to measure the, the sky projected obliquity of, of a planet. And the amplitude of this effect depends on how much of the surface of the star you're blocking, right? The ratio of the, the planet radius to the star radius, as well as the rotation period of the star. So this plays a really important role. And so returning to, to this HR diagram, the, the region that we really want to fill in is up here, right? There are very few evolved systems for which this measurement has been made. And that's partly because it's pretty challenging to measure for a couple of reasons. I put the equation for the amplitude of the RM effect back on here. Um, and as you evolve, the as, as your star evolves, the ratio of the planet radius to the star radius goes down because the stellar radius is increasing. 
the rotation velocity of the star also goes down as the star slows down as it as it expands and that transit duration goes up and so it, it often takes seven eight nine hours of continuous observation to measure the Rossmann McLaughlin effect for a planet transiting an evolved star which is a lot of time to commit to, to one target or so the TAC tells me. <laughs> um, but we were able to, to get this measurement for a few evolved systems. So here are three that I've highlighted. Um, I, I just wanna basically point your attention to the fact that these are all kind of typical subgiants. They're sitting just on the cool side of the craft break, which is roughly 6,200 Kelvin. And they're all uh, a bit higher mass. so. 1.4, 1.5, 1 1.3 solar masses. And we did some stellar modeling that showed that these stars were hotter than the craft break for their main sequence lifetimes. So these are things that we're uh, really interested in understanding because they have gained these deeper convective envelopes during their, their recent evolution. So I'll just show the, the observations of these uh, systems. Here's the first one, which shows that nice sinusoidal uh, component that I described earlier which is consistent with being aligned. So it has this very low obliquity. The next one, 6029, also showed a nice sinusoidal curve, uh, maybe a little bit higher, but we also um, lost a little bit of it to weather, but still close to, to zero. And finally, this most recent one that we, we measured also shows a low obliquity. And so this modeling was done fitting the test photometry simultaneously with the radial velocities for the planet and the Rossmann McLaughlin effect. And so we get this really nice constraint on the obliquity that shows all three of these systems, which cross the craft rake, are consistent with being aligned. And so now if we return to this figure that I've shown a few times and drop our three stars onto this, this, uh, this plot, as well as a couple uh, subgiants from the literature, you can see this picture starts to emerge where our stars which cross the craft break are well aligned and consistent with this kind of cool, well aligned main sequence population. <clears throat> so now the question is less, what happens when you move across the craft break? It's more, how do you end up uh, with these aligned systems? So how do you move from this misaligned population down into this cool, well aligned population? So a big component of this work has been developing a model for the tidal damping of both the orbital period and the obliquity of these planets. And so we create this toy model that allows you to simultaneously damp the obliquity and the orbital period. And so I show here in this figure on the top, the evolution of the orbital period of a planet over time, and on the bottom, the evolution of its obliquity. And these are defined by uh, some, some theoretical predictions for these timescales from a paper by Dong Lai that shows um, uh, a dependence on a few things that will change with stellar evolution. So I won't get into too much detail here, but I do wanna highlight a few of these features that change pretty dramatically with stellar evolution. One of them is this A over R star parameter that will change as the stellar radius increases. This Q prime parameter, which is uh, a it's called the tidal quality factor. It's basically um, a prescription for how efficiently you damp out um, that angular momentum in the convective envelope. Uh, and then the mean stellar density also changes. Uh, and then for the obliquity, which is actually shown here as, as um, lambda or as, um, yeah, so it's the mean stellar density also changes and the uh, rotation period of the star will also change as it, as it evolves off of the main sequence. And so, the other thing that will change kind of indirectly is the orbital period of the planet as it starts to in spiral in, and that will change the efficiencies of both of these properties as well. And so you might be staring at this and wondering what happens to both the period and the obliquity here towards the end of the star's lifetime. You can see that it drops off precipitously, and this is as the star enters this phase of runaway in spiral, or as the, the planet enters this phase of runaway in spiral around the star. So you get this very efficient, uh, uh, damping of the angular momentum of the planet, it starts spiraling in and then that efficiency of in spiral increases and it kind of collides into its star. And you can see that the planet has almost no chance to start to realign until right at the end when it's basically been engulfed. 
And so the problem here is that the planet's orbit fully decays before realignment can occur. Um, and this runaway in spiral phase takes over and the planet ends up being engulfed. And so one solution to this is that uh, you can assume that there's a different efficiency for the damping of the spin orbit alignment and the efficiency of orbital decay. And so yeah, here's the, the phase where it enters engulfment. Um, and so if you assume different efficiencies for uh, the damping of the orbital period and the damping of obliquity, you can end up with a case where the planet uh, survives until the end of its uh, like subgiant branch, to so the base of the red giant branch or something like that. Um, and the obliquity ends up being damped out very efficiently. And so you can end up with this case where the, the system realigns if you uh, prescribe the efficiencies of these damping mechanisms differently. And so there are some ways that you can do this, uh, some physically motivated ideas for why there might be different efficiencies. One of them is that the core and the envelope of the star may be decoupled. And so the planet can just apply a torque to only the outer envelope of the star without having to kind of gravitationally pull on the full uh, mass of the star. And the other is that in the presence of a convective envelope, a misaligned orbit will actually drive inertial waves down through that outer convective envelope. And this is just because of the Coriolis force, right? So if you have an inclined orbit relative to some material that's convecting, it's gonna start driving waves that will dissipate that angular momentum. And so if we look at uh, inertial waves being driven by the Coriolis force as, as a mechanism for uh, enhancing the efficiency of the damping of obliquity, um, there are some studies that have shown that it can actually be incredibly efficient. So this, this paper by Ogilvy and Lin showed that in the presence of the Coriolis force, the value of that tidal quality factor can be, uh, can be reduced by about four orders of magnitude, which would result in the same efficiency enhancement. And this should only contribute to the damping of the inclination, that, that obliquity, and not to the orbital period um, uh, because of the because the inertial waves are static in the the inertial frame and so it's not in it's not acting on the uh the angular momentum of the orbit at all it's only acting on the or angular momentum of the inclination and so if we take that toy model that we developed for the damping of obliquity and put it back on this same diagram you can end up with some some case where you start with a highly inclined orbit and then as you cross the craft break that convective envelope grows and you enhance the efficiency of the damping of obliquity, you can rapidly re realign without the planet being engulfed. And so it gives you this kind of uh, example of, of a way that you could move from this misaligned distribution into a, a cool aligned population. And so tying this back to the hot Jupiter formation scenarios, right? The predictions for these different theories um, result in, in the, the different distributions of obliquities. Um, but now if we add the effect of this efficient realignment to our highest interest in migration scenario, it accurately predicts kind of the, the observed population seen here, right? That mostly aligned cool population and that broadly misaligned hot population. And so the combination of these two, high interest in migration and efficient tidal realignment seem to be consistent with the, the pathways for hot Jupiter formation. And so by looking specifically at stars that are undergoing these uh, changes more, more uh, kind of rapidly and recently, we can start to understand the time scales for how how obliquity gets damped out. Um, but ultimately, this is a small sample, right? And we need a larger sample of confirmed planets with measured eccentricities and obliquities to better pin down some of these these relationships. And so, I'll quickly walk through some of the ways that we're working on expanding this sample um, with the Giants Pipeline. So just to kind of revisit the, the Giants pipeline, here's a little flow chart that shows kind of the, the picture of how we're finding planets, right? We start with the raw test sectors, we generate our light curves, we do some, some statistics to measure the BLS uh, period and, and things like that. So we get some basic transit statistics. Um, if you have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, it's feasible, but time consuming to look at them all by eye and flip through a bunch of summary plots and end up with some planet candidates. This is what we did initially. Me and Sam Grunblatt sat down and looked through like 300,000 summary plots and found a couple hundred planet candidates. Um, 
and have started following those up. Some of them ended up being false positives. Some of them uh, have become confirmed planets and a lot of the ones that are in our sample so far were identified that way. But this has become a little less reasonable now that we have millions of summary plots to look through. Um, it's just a little too time consuming. And so we're working on ways to automate this process a bit more. Um, and so by introducing kind of this automated detection step and then uh, further photometric vetting to reduce our, our sample of higher priority things for, for follow-up, we're ending up with a large sample of planet candidates, some of which we have uh, follow-up time to confirm and, um, and will eventually become kind of a, a larger confirmed planet paper. So for the, the automated detection step, uh, I've been working with a grad student at Lehigh University, Emma Page, who's developing a random forest classifier for uh, identifying transits. And the way this works is it takes real light curves generated by our pipeline, injects uh, planet transits using a transit model with a, a range of periods and radii and things like that that cover kind of where we expect to detect planets. And then uh, the random forest classifier, uh, we can apply that to our, our full sample and hopefully identify some real planets. And so this just shows that um, the, the classifier retrieves the orbital period pretty well. This is uh, the retrieved period on the y-axis versus the injected period on the x-axis. And that one-to-one -one line is really nicely populated. And the color bar shows the um, kind of likelihood prescribed by the, the maximum power in the BLS periodogram. As you can see, there's a nice one-to-one -one relation. You have some harmonics of that that are also pretty strong, um, but otherwise it, it does a pretty good job of identifying those. And then here's the, the confusion matrix. If you're interested in machine learning stuff, this basically just shows the things that were true positives and true negatives on the diagonal versus the mis misclassifications on the off diagonal. And it predicts our training set with 94% accuracy, which is pretty good. Um, and it reduces our sample of uh, 50,000, our kind of preliminary set that we ran the classifier on, down to about 3,000 high priority candidates. And so it's a nice order of magnitude drop that makes it a little bit more reasonable to, to do this search. Um, and so the things that are identified by the, the classifier move on to kind of further photometric vetting and will go into our larger catalog. Um, one issue with this approach is that we use the Boxley Squares periodogram transit search as kind of our main approach for identifying transits and creating the training parameters. And this requires multiple transits. You need to have some periodic signal. So you have something that transits only once in a test sector, it's gonna be completely missed by this approach. And so that's where we've been collaborating with the Planet Hunters test team, where volunteers can uh, go onto the Zooniverse website and identify individual transits by eye. Uh, and so we've been working with uh, Dr. Nora Eisner, who's a Flatiron Fellow at the CCA. And uh, our light curves from the, the Giants Pipeline are all hosted on the Planet Hunters test servers, and it's going to go live pretty soon. So pretty soon you'll be able to go onto Zooniverse and look through our light curves and start trying to find these long periods, single transiting event, things like that. And one of the reasons we're really interested in doing this is that if you look at the uh, distribution of planets confirmed around evolved stars or uh, detected around evolved stars, here I show the stellar radius on the y-axis and the orbital period on the x-axis. Uh, if you see the things identified by transits, they're all pretty short period, which is unsurprising. That's the detection bias. You need to have lots of, lots of transits. Uh, they all pile up at these kind of short periods. And then the things transiting or orbiting evolved stars detected by radial velocities are mostly long period um, further out here. And so the planet hunters sample is starting to fill in this space in between them. And so these are evolved systems that were previously identified by planet hunters. Um, and you can see that they kind of start to bridge this gap in really interesting ways. And so if we wanna understand how things like the period eccentricity distribution extend out to further separations, we'll need uh, a larger sample of things in this kind of intermediate period space to, to kind of connect that gap. And so we're hoping to, to start to fill this in with that Planet Hunter sample. I'll very quickly hit some, some future things that we're working on. So one of them is a catalog of, of confirmed planets orbiting evolved stars and tests. And so I show here the 
things we've already published in Black, and we have a handful of new discoveries that will start to fill this space. Um, some of them a bit more massive and show really interesting features. And so that's coming before too long. Then the other thing that we're really interested in doing is kind of expanding the, the sample of these Roster McLaughlin measurements to get obliquities for, for a wider range of stellar hosts, particularly in these regions that I've highlighted here. So in order to actually pin down the time scale for this damping, it's really important to uh, kind of find the starting point, right? And so what we want to do is start to measure the Roster McLaughlin effect for some things that are hotter than the craft rake and start to see when this obliquity begins to be damped out and understand if, if this is an effect of, of the emergence of the convective envelope and how strongly it depends on the kind of stellar evolutionary phase. And then we also want to understand kind of the end stages of these systems, so things that have evolved even further. Uh, these will be challenging observations, but we have a couple that, that may fill this region. Uh, and so it'll be really valuable to kind of extend this on either side of our current sample and get a, a, a fuller picture of the, the history of these systems. All right, so with that, I'll go ahead and leave my, my summary slide up and I'm happy to take any questions. Great. And I have a question. Can you hear me fine from here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I had a question on your slide 29 about the weekend magnet breaking. I was mm -hmm. curious about why for the high pass star such like a, a nice trend early on because if the weekend magnetic breaking is because of the convective the, the dying of the convective envelope, I thought we didn't have those. You know, Let's like, see. Funny in there. Uh, yes. Yeah, so for this higher mass range, all of these should have convective envelopes. It's really up to um, uh, about 1.2 solar masses that you experience magnetic breaking uh, significantly. Right. And so you can see here, we, we basically select things that start around 1.2 uh, solar masses and below. So as we, we go like right up to the edge of, of crash break. Yeah. Yeah, is the reason why these, do you have the weekend magnetic breaking that's different? Times yeah, it's it's very dependent on the mass. It it ends up being a really nice function of what's called the Rossby number, which is a relationship between the orbital period and the convective overturn time scale. And the convective overturn time scale is going to be really strongly dependent on the the mass of the star. It's also metallicity dependent, and so there's kind of a lot of different different dimensions here. But this is kind of the cleanest way to split it up into to mass spins. Yeah. I had a question about, um, so is disk migration then kind of ruled out by the detection of misaligned orbits? Yeah, so basically the fact that we see misaligned orbits at all, even just around main sequence stars. Is that your question? Yeah, yeah, like does that rule out disk migration? Um, that's a really good question, and not necessarily, um, because as stars circularize, they're more likely to undergo secular interactions with other planets, um, because you're moving through different resonances and through different kind of uh, places where you'll have gravitational interactions with stars. And so even in the disk migration scenario, you may end up with uh, kind of scattering events that cause misalignments. And so these aren't, again, this is kind of a simplification. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. If you're kind of moving through a disk, and then have some encounter with another massive planet that can scatter you, even if the dominant migration mechanism is this, uh, this disk migration, right? And so the, the thing that we're really trying to poke at is how efficient is that, that realignment process? And can you get from a, a highly eccentric misaligned orbit down into the, the configuration we see today? Gotcha, okay. So it's more just like trying to see if high eccentricity migration is even possible, and it's only possible when realignment is really efficient. Mm -hmm. cool. All right, thank you. What do the M body people say about this? Do you know? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I I've talked to a couple M body people about this, uh, like DJ Dong at the CCA and, and people like that. Um, 
And it's very difficult to simulate this with n-body simulations because the time resolution you need to trace both the stellar evolution and the orbital evolution is really fine. Um, and so it, it's kind of uh, too granular to realistically simulate with n-body simulations, but the dynamics are consistent with, with the types of things they predict in terms of circularization timescales and scattering timescales and things like that. And so it's, it's using, um, it's using prescriptions for the in spiral and, and circularization and damping timescales from like theoretical work that relies on n-body simulations. Um, but again, it's it's kind of hard to trace simultaneously the evolution of the interior structure of the star and the dynamics. But that would be, I mean, an amazing combination. If you had rebound plus Mesa, that would be a, a great tool. <laughs> And then coming going off of that, I know you talked about simulating like a convection region or different layers of the star. I guess it's, I don't work with stellar simulations, but I guess I'm just wondering how much of like the fluid dynamics you have to simulate versus just like what the layers are. Yeah, it's on this slide. Yeah, this is a pretty um, simple version of, of the interior structure. So we just use like the Schwarzschild criterion to define where the the boundary of the convective zone is so it's essentially kind of the, the here actually i have a, a slide that shows the a backup slide that shows the um, boundary and radius which is another another nice way to look at it um yeah so you can see that in in the radius fraction it it has a bit more uh clear structure as it as it dips into the star and so what we're really doing is just uh tracing in one dimensional models where the kind of temperature and pressure gradients are amenable to, uh, to convection occurring. All right, if there's no more questions, let's thank Nick again.